if the great commission he the sick and preach the word lest the church neglect its mission and the gospel go unheard help us witness to your purpose with renewed integrity with the spirit's gifts empower us for the work of ministry. Lord, you call us to your service in my name, baptize and teach that the world may trust your promise Life abundant meant for each. Give us all new fervor, draw us closer in community. With the Spirit's gifts, empower us. For the work of ministry. Lord, you make the common holy, this my body, this my blood. Let your priests for earth's true glory daily lift life heavenward asking that the world around us share your children's liberty with the spirit's gifts Empower us for the work of ministry. Lord, you show us love's true measure. Father, what they do forgive. Yet we hope as private treasure, all that you so freely give. May your care and mercy lead us to a just society with the Spirit its gifts empower us for the work of ministry. Lord, you bless with words assuring I am with you to Yes.
sacerdos manius, qui in diebus suis placuit Deo. Fecit illum dominus, crescere in plebem In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. I welcome everyone today to this uh, great moment in the life of our local church, and indeed beyond, as we participate in the great sacrament of Episcopal ordination, as Bishop Camilleri is ordained as the successor of the apostles for the service of God's people. We're very honored to have with us, and I welcome Monsignor Rotor from the Nunciature in Ottawa, who is here representing our Holy Father, Pope Francis. And this is a sign of the universality of the church. Of course, we are the church in Toronto, we're not the church of Toronto, and that's a good reminder to have for all dioceses. I welcome as well uh, all of those who are joining us through the modern wonders of technology. Uh, we would like to have people <laughs> physically present here more, uh, but we'll do that later. We'll have a great celebration as is appropriate. Uh, and we'll have the opportunity for Bishop Camilleri to walk among the people of God, to give them his blessing, and we celebrate together for this great moment in the life, especially of our local church. But we do welcome, I welcome all of those thousands of people, especially Bishop Camilleri's family and the thousands throughout the Archdiocese and around the world, in fact, who are with us today in this wave through the live streaming of this celebration of the Holy Eucharist by this Episcopal ordination. And so as we come together, as always, we call to mind our sins and acknowledge our sins and prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, of a virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory. Take 
take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Have mercy on us. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good Let us pray. O God, who taught the whole world through the preaching of the blessed apostle Paul, draw us, we pray, nearer to you through the example of him whose conversion we celebrate today, and so make us witnesses to your truth in the world. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, to display his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. To God. Here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, here I am. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See 
I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. Here I am, Lord, I come to A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as Saul was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with Saul stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground and though his eyes were open, he couldn't see nothing. So they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has, se he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here, he has authority from the chief of priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house, he laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, Saul was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, Jesus is the Son of God. All who heard Saul were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoke this name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
from the world, says the Lord, to go and bear fruit that will last. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And, and with, with your, your spirit. spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory, Glory to, to you, you o, Lord. o Lord. Jesus said to the eleven, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Da 
Most Reverend Father, the Church of Toronto asks you to ordain this priest, Ivan Philip Camilleri, to the responsibility of the Episcopate. Do you have a mandate from the Apostolic See? We have. Let it be read. Francis, Bishop, servant of the servants of God, sends greetings and apostolic blessing to his beloved son, Ivan Philip Camilleri, priest of the Metropolitan Church of Toronto, and therein, up to this time, vicar general and moderator of the Curia, now appointed auxiliary bishop of the same archdiocese, and also titular bishop of Teglata in Numidia. In communion with Christ's mission, we, divinely entrusted with the governance of the universal church, come to the aid because of concern for the pastors of the souls who ask assistance in their pastoral duties in order that they may have the ability to accomplish their task more easily. So now, we turn our attention in aiding the growth of the flock in Toronto, whose spiritual leader, our venerable brother Thomas Christopher Collins, most recently asked that the assistance of a new auxiliary be given to him and an associate for the governance of the diocese. Therefore, beloved son, moved by this concern, we considered you having dedicated yourself to the task of spiritual care of the clergy and laity. We judge that you can engage in a new task of Episcopal duties. Therefore, having consulted with the Congregation for Bishops, with the fullness of our apostolic power and authority, we nominate you Auxiliary Bishop of the Metropolitan Church of Toronto and to the titular see of Teglata in Numidia, conferring upon you the rights and imposing attendant obligations which are bound by the norms of the law to this office. You may receive your Episcopal ordination outside the city of Rome from any Catholic bishop and in accord with the liturgical laws. Before your ordination, however, you must make the profession of faith and take the oath of fidelity to us and our successors according to the norms of ecclesiastical law. Beloved son, while we exhort you to render all your zeal in Episcopal ministry in association with the work of the ordinary, we beseech the Lord that he may grant you to be mindful always of his humility that must be greatly cultivated which elevates us in the company of the just and enables us to be close to God. Given at Rome, at the Lateran, on the 28th day of November, 2020, on the year of our pontificate, Francis. This day is, of course, an occasion of deep significance for Bishop Camilleri as he has ordained to the episcopate and becomes a successor of the apostles. 
called and sent to be both apostle and spiritual shepherd, it is an occasion of equal significance for all of us. It is a time of joy for the new bishop's family and friends, for everyone in the Archdiocese of Toronto and for the Universal Church, since every bishop is ordained to be a member of the Episcopal College, led by the successor of Peter, out of which he is sent to fulfill a particular mission. This is why each bishop, whatever his specific apostolic assignment, is exhorted to have a concern for the whole church throughout the world. We are all one in Christ. This universal dimension in the Episcopal office is made clear in the mandate from Francis, bishop, servant to the servants of God, by which this ordination is authorized. And it is made clear also through the presence amongst us today of Monsignor Roter, who is the counselor at the Nunciature and who represents the Holy Father. Bishop Sheen wisely entitled his great book on the priesthood, The Priest is Not His Own. That is even more true of the bishop. He is not his own. By ordination, he enters into the College of Bishops. And so today, following an ancient tradition of the church, Bishop Camilleri will be ordained not only by me, but by all of the bishops present, representing that wider context of a bishop's vocation. An Episcopal ordination is an occasion for all of us bishops to renew our personal commitment to Christ the High Priest, the Good Shepherd, who has called us and sent us to care for the spiritual flock entrusted to us. And it is an occasion for the whole people of God to meditate upon the apostolic office, which is a fundamental reality in our life in Christ. It is not for nothing that St. John in the Apocalypse points to the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb written on the foundation stones of the heavenly Jerusalem. Those chosen to share in the apostolic office are frail sinners as we see spectacularly in the original 12, and we have sadly seen down through the ages. Ordination is not an admission to a circle of elite disciples, nor is it a special ticket to heaven. The great divine treasure of the apostolic office is housed in earthen human vessels. The diocesan bishop rightly says, me, your unworthy servant, in the Eucharistic prayer. And one of the most dramatic signs at every ordination is when moments before he is ordained, the candidate lies flat on the floor as we all pray for him and invoke the prayers of all the saints that he may be found faithful in fulfilling the apostolic office entrusted to him. But for all that, this act in which we are engaged today is an act of God, as is every sacrament. We who exercise the sacred ministry are humanly frail instruments of his wondrous grace. Whatever the specific way in which we live out our baptismal consecration, perhaps through marriage or religious profession or ordination, it is good for us all to meditate deeply upon the significance of Episcopal ordination, so basic to the life of us all as disciples of Jesus, nourished by word and sacrament. For the bishop is the minister of word and sacrament, ordained to teach, to shepherd, and to sanctify, so that we may all grow in Christ as we journey through this valley of tears, homeward bound to the heavenly Jerusalem. Monsignor Ronald Knox, the great English preacher and scholar of the last century, once spoke of how, although he had personally experienced the benefits of a full Oxford education with all the trimmings, he found that in a simple Catholic school, for all its simplicity, the education was so focused as to lead the students to fly to the heart of things. In this time of pandemic, this time of affliction and restriction, much that is valuable is cut away for a while, which is a sacrifice. 
but one which may perhaps lead us to a greater focus in our life of discipleship, to fly to the heart of things. Perhaps also in this somewhat externally restricted celebration of Episcopal ordination, restricted because of the almost penitential austerities of the pandemic, we may be enabled to focus more intently on the heart of things, on the glorious act of God by which a successor of the apostles is consecrated, an act of God which over the centuries has many times taken place in greater simplicity and amid circumstances far more dire than what we experience today. I propose two ways to enter into the heart of Episcopal ordination and what it signifies for us all. First, through the words of sacred scripture on this feast day of the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Second, through the example of bishops in whose lives the Episcopal charism has radiated with particular splendor. So first of all, the readings of sacred scripture. The conversion of St. Paul is so important that it is not only referred to at various points in his letters, but is described no fewer than three times in the Acts of the Apostles. And the second reading today is the first of those references. When we consider the significance of this event for the mission of a successor of the Apostles, the key point is that the apostolic mission is based on an encounter with the Lord Jesus, with the risen Lord. It is certainly true in the Gospels when as Jesus walks along and comes upon a person whom he has chosen, he says, come, follow me. And that person drops everything to follow him. This is the difference between a vocation and a career. A vocation arises out of an encounter with the Lord and out of the initiative of the Lord. It is not something planned or controlled by the one who is called. The risen Lord is in command, using the apostle to evangelize the world in his name. After abruptly upsetting the personal agenda of Saul, he sent Ananias to him with the words, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. When it comes to the call to apostolic ministry these days, a phone call from the nuncio replaces the flash of light on the Damascus Road. But the point is the same. The risen Lord has a mission to entrust to his disciple. And in these days, as in the conversion of St. Paul, although the call comes from the Lord, members of the church have a part to play in it as Ananias does in baptizing Paul, and as do the other Christians in Damascus, Antioch, and Jerusalem, who form Paul for ministry and determine his mission. God calls us now, as then, through the church. The bishop is not his own. A vocation requires conversion, and that was remarkably so in the case of Paul, transformed by grace from persecutor to missionary. But each one of us who is called to apostolic ministry must leave all behind and not cling to anything that prevents us from following the master. There's a wise ancient tradition for both the bishop of the one being ordained to pray the seven penitential psalms in connection with the ordination. Apostolic vocation comes from an encounter with the Lord. And it must also be shaped by the imitation of Christ in his mission from the Father. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus began his own ministry, out of which all apostolic ministry arises, by reading Isaiah chapter 61 in the synagogue. It speaks of the care for the vulnerable, and the proclamation of hope that is at the heart of Episcopal service caring for the sick, the needy, such as the sick person being brought to the hospital nearby, founded by our first bishop, 
who was buried below the sanctuary, who gave his life in caring for the needy and the sick. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to proclaim good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Here we have words of healing and of hope, but also a note of prophetic sharpness at the end. For the bishop is called both to encourage the weak and to rebuke those who, if unchallenged by the pastor, are headed for the day of vengeance of our God. St. Gregory the Great wrote the best manual ever for bishops, the pastoral care, to help bishops to discern wisely when to encourage and when to rebuke. Although there is a possible Maltese connection in today's gospel, in the line about handling poisonous snakes, as Paul did when shipwrecked in Malta, the main insight into the Episcopal mission is found in the words which mirror the Great Commission at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said to the 11, go out into the whole world to proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved but the one who does not believe will be condemned. As is symbolized in the holding of the book of the gospels over the head of the newly ordained bishop during the prayer of consecration, the proclamation of the good news is at the very heart of the Episcopal mission. As with every vocation in life, each of us receives inspiration and guidance from the example of those who have gone before us or who presently exercise that vocation. This is why we celebrate wedding anniversaries and anniversaries of religious profession and ordination. Each of us is inspired by those whom we have encountered over the years, whose fidelity in their vocation leads us to seek to imitate them. And each of us has our own particular examples, every one of us. I know that I will forever be grateful for the bishops in my life, especially two extraordinary Episcopal mentors, Bishop Paul Redding, who ordained me to the diaconate and priesthood, and Bishop Anthony Tonus, my Episcopal father, who ordained me to the episcopate. And I can think of, of course, here in this cathedral, the great Michael Power, the bishop who died at the age of 42, caring for those with typhoid, reaching out to those most vulnerable and in need, and using his organizational abilities to help the people of Toronto assist them. We think of Armand de Charbonnel, the second bishop of this diocese, who gave his life here as well to serve the people, though he felt always ill at ease because he could not speak the language well, and yet he truly served and cared for the people as a model bishop. In fact, at this Mass, as at important occasion in the life of our church, I'll be using the St. Helen's Chalice. This was given to Bishop Charbonnel by Pope Pius IX in 1850 when he ordained him a bishop in the Sistine Chapel. It took three years to find someone willing to be the Bishop of Toronto. I suppose since the previous one died of typhoid, that might have made the work of the choice a bit more difficult but we have great bishops to look to. But I propose three canonized saints as models for every bishop. They lived in the period from the late 1400s to the early 1600s, a time of turbulence, violence, plague, and corruption in church and state, but also a period of astonishing holiness and spiritual vigor, as is our own age, as is every age. If we become overwhelmed at the state of the world is in or the church is in, we can learn from the wisdom of that great Catholic masterpiece, the Lord of the Rings. The wicked and seemingly all-powerful Sauron, who is the malevolent Lord of the Rings, is once more moving into action. And the virtuous little hobbit Frodo moans, I wish it need not have happened in my time. But wise Gandalf replies, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide 
is what to do with the time that is given us. So here are three bishops who knew what to do with the time that was given to them. First of all, St. John Fisher. He lived to the time of Henry VIII in the early 1500s, a man of learning and prayer, which together helped him to see through the pretensions of his age, the toxic zeitgeist of his time. He courageously spoke truth to power in the days of the wicked King Henry VIII. He resisted the king's attack on marriage as Henry tried to get rid of the faithful Queen Catherine of Aragon. And he resisted the king's plan to reject the apostolic authority of the successor of Peter, the state trying to take over the role of the church. Like his friend Thomas More, Bishop Fisher was faithful to his conscience rightly formed by reason and faith matured in study and prayer. His courage when both society and church were going astray arose out of the fact that he went ever deeper in his Catholic faith, in the encounter with the Lord Jesus in word and sacrament. Second, St. Charles Borromeo, an Italian aristocrat who became cardinal when he was about 21 or two, an archbishop because in the corrupt church of his day he had the advantage of being the nephew of the Pope. He was, in fact, a holy man. He was not learned like John Fisher, though he kept a picture of the martyred bishop on his desk, but he was decisive in rooting out corruption in the church and in building up the diocese, especially in the formation of priests. He invented seminaries. He led by the example of his holy and penitential life. He was with this people in time of plague. Charles Borromeo led the true reformation and the purification of the church and he insisted that this begin with personal repentance. And finally, St. Francis de Sales. He was a man who always struggled with anger, but who by God's grace was known as a most gentle man who wanted more oil than vinegar in his salad dressing. He, in addition to prayer, he devoted an hour each day to study and was known even amid the violence of his age for his commitment to clarity and charity. He clearly expounded the richness of the Catholic faith and all its purity, but in a spirit of gentleness. It was said that if you wanted to beat someone down in an argument, get someone else. But if you wanted to convert the person, send for Francis de Sales. In his introduction to the devout life, he showed how the call to holiness is universal, though holiness takes different shapes in different situations in life. When a newly ordained bishop asked his advice on preaching, he replied in a lengthy letter which contains the advice that is always pertinent. The lips speak to the ears, but heart speaks to heart. Preaching the word of God is the basic responsibility of the bishop, and the preaching must arise from the consistent life of the preacher. Heart speaks to heart. So I propose these saintly bishops as models for Bishop Camilleri and for all of us bishops today which I propose is a, suppose is a sensible thing to do at an Episcopal ordination. So now we proceed to the ordination of Bishop Camilleri, surrounding him with our heartfelt prayers as he begins the sacred mission to which Jesus through the church has called him. By pondering the central words of the consecration of a bishop, let us be attentive to what God will now do. These words say it all. Now pour forth upon this chosen one the power that is from you, the governing spirit, whom you gave to your beloved son, Jesus Christ, and whom he gave to, he gave to the holy apostles who established the church in each place as your sanctuary, to the glory and unfailing praise of your name. The ancient rule of the Holy Fathers decrees that the one to be ordained bishop should be questioned in the presence of the people concerning his resolve 
to guard the faith and to discharge its office. Therefore, dear brother, do you resolve to carry out until death with the grace of the Holy Spirit the office entrusted to us by the apostles and to be passed on to you through the laying on of our hands? I do. Do you resolve to proclaim the gospel of Christ faithfully and unfailingly? I do. Do you resolve to guard the deposit of faith pure and entire according to the tradition preserved always and everywhere in the church from the time of the apostles? I do. Do you resolve to build up the body of Christ, his church, and to remain in her unity with the order of bishops under the authority of the successor of the blessed apostle Peter? I do. Do you resolve to render obedience faithfully to the successor of the blessed apostle Peter? I do. Do you resolve as a devoted father to encourage the holy people of God and to guide them in the way of salvation together with priests and deacons, your fellow ministers? I do. Do you resolve for the sake of the Lord's name to show yourself welcoming and merciful to the poor, to strangers, and to all those who are in need? I do. Do you resolve as a good shepherd to seek out the sheep who stray and to gather them into the Lord's fold. I do. Do you resolve to pray without ceasing to Almighty God for his holy people and to carry out the office of high priest without reproach? I do with the help of God. May God, who has begun the good work in you, bring it to fulfillment. Let us pray. Dearly beloved, that the loving kindness of Almighty God, providing for the welfare of the church, may grant to this chosen one an abundance of his grace. Let us kneel. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. Saint Michael, pray for us. Holy angels of God, pray for us. Saint John the Baptist, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Peter and Saint Paul, pray for us. Saint Andrew, pray for us. Saint James, pray for us. Saint John, Pray for us. Saint Thomas, pray for us. Saint James, pray for us. Saint Philip, pray for us. Saint Bartholomew, pray for us. Saint Matthew, pray for us. Saint Simon, pray for us. Saint Jude, pray for us. Saint Matthias, pray for us. Saint Mary Magdalene, pray for us. Saint Stephen, pray for us. Saint Ignatius of Antioch, pray for us. Saint Lawrence, pray for us. Saint Perpetua and Saint Felicity, pray for us. Saint Publius, pray for us. Saint Agatha, pray for us. Saint Agnes, pray for us. Saint Gregory, pray for us. Saint Raymond of Penafort, pray for us. Saint Augustine, 
pray for us. Saint Athanasius, pray for us. Saint Basil, pray for us. Saint Martin, pray for us. Saint Benedict, pray for us. Saint Francis and Saint Dominic, pray for us. Saint Francis Xavier, pray for us. Saint Charles Borromeo, pray for us. Saint John Vianney, pray for us. Saint Catherine of Siena, pray for us. Saint Teresa of Jesus, pray for us. Saint Jose Sanchez de Rio, pray for us. Saint George Preca, pray for us. Saint John Paul II, pray for us. O holy men and women, saints of God, pray for us. Lord, be merciful. Lord, deliver us, we pray. From all evil, Lord, deliver us, we pray. From every sin, Lord, deliver us, we pray. From everlasting death, Lord, deliver us, we pray. By your incarnation, Lord, deliver us, we pray. By your death and resurrection, Lord, deliver us, we pray. By your outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Lord, deliver us, we pray. Be merciful to us sinners, Lord, we ask you hear our prayer. Govern and protect your holy church, Lord, we ask you hear our prayer. Keep the Pope and all ordained in faithful service to your church. Lord, we ask you hear our prayer. Bless this chosen man. Lord, we ask you hear our prayer. Bless and sanctify this chosen man. Lord, we ask you hear our prayer. Bless, sanctify, and consecrate this chosen man. Lord, we ask you hear our prayer. Bring all peoples together in peace and true harmony. Lord, we ask you hear our prayer. Comfort all the troubled and afflicted with your mercy. Lord, we ask you hear our prayer. Strengthen us and keep us in your holy service. Lord, we ask you, hear our prayer. Jesus, Son of the living God, Lord, we ask you, hear our prayer. Christ, hear us. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. Christ graciously us. Graciously hear our petitions, O Lord. And as you raise the horn of priestly grace over this your servant, pour out upon him the power of your blessing through Christ our Lord. Let us stand.
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father of mercies and God of all consolation, who dwell on high and look upon the lowly, who know all things before they come to be. It is you who establish order in your church through your gracious word, who from the beginning predestined a righteous people born of Abraham, who instituted rulers and priests and did not leave your sanctuary without ministry, who from the beginning of the world have been pleased to be glorified in those whom you have chosen. Pour forth now upon this chosen one the power that is from you, the governing spirit, whom you gave to your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and whom he gave to the holy apostles, who established the church in each place as your sanctuary, to the glory and unfailing praise of your name. Grant, O Father, knower of all hearts, that this your servant, whom you have chosen for the episcopate, may nourish your holy flock, and may without reproach exercise before you the high priesthood, serving you night and day, that he may unceasingly cause your face to shine upon us and offer the gifts of your holy church. Grant that by the strength of the spirit of the high priesthood, he may have authority to forgive sins according to your command, that he may apportion offices according to your precept, and loosen every bond according to the authority you gave the apostles. May he be pleasing to you in meekness and purity of heart, offering a sweet fragrance to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, through whom, through whom glory and power and honor are yours with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, both now and forever and ever. Amen. May God, who has made you a sharer in the high priesthood of Christ, himself pour out upon you the oil of mystical anointing and make you fruitful with an abundance of spiritual blessing. Receive the gospel and preach the word of God with all patience and sound teaching. Receive this ring, the seal of fidelity, and adorned with undefiled faith, preserve unblemished the bride of God, the Holy Church.
Receive the mitre and let the splendor of holiness shine in you so that when the chief shepherd appears, you may merit to receive the unfading crown of glory. Receive the crozier, the sign of the pastoral office, and keep watch over the whole flock in which the Holy Spirit has placed you as bishop to govern the church of God. Amen. Disciples of all nations, Alleluia, Alleluia. Go into the world, Alleluia, and make disciples of all nations, Alleluia, Alleluia. Make disciples of all nations. Alleluia, Alleluia. Say 
My sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and for the good of all his holy church. As we celebrate the divine mysteries, O Lord, we pray, may the Spirit fill us with that light of faith with which he constantly enlightened the blessed Apostle Paul for the spreading of your glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and eternal God. For you, eternal shepherd, do not desert your flock, but through the blessed apostles watch over it and protect it always, so that it may be governed by those you have appointed shepherds to lead it in the name of your Son. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna. Blessed is he who 
To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, me, your unworthy servant, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord Jesus, and all are known to you. For them we offer you the sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves, and all who are dear to them for the redemption of their souls, in hope of healing and well-being, and praying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogenus, John and Paul, Cosmas, and Damian, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands. And with eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more, giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the Blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ, your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us. This pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them, 
as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who, though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant to some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints, Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and form by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive, forgive those who trespass against, against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil. evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the, for the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and, and the glory, glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And, and with, with your, your spirit. spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Peace be with you. Peace. Peace be with you. Peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I, am I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only, only say the word, and my, and my soul shall be healed. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Let us pray. May the sacrament we have received, O Lord our God, stir up in us that fire of charity with which the blessed Apostle Paul burned ardently as he bore his concern for all the churches. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And I now invite Monsignor Rotor to speak to us on behalf of the Holy Father. Dear Cardinal Collins, dear bishops, dear brothers and sisters, on behalf of our Holy Father, Pope Francis, I am pleased to bring greetings to the Church of Toronto, 
and its beloved shepherd, Cardinal Collins, his bishops, as also the clergy, re re religious, and lay faithful of this great archdiocese. I also assure you of his affection as well as his spiritual participation in today's liturgy in this venerable cathedral basilica of St. Michael's on this beautiful feast of the conversion of St. Paul. Monsignor Ivan, over the past number of years, you have displayed your devotion and de dedication to this ecclesial community as a tireless servant of the Cardinal Archbishop, especially in your work in the Chancery. From service behind the scenes, you will now have a more public role, an office to fulfill. You have become a member of the Episcopal College and a su successor of the Apostles in communion with the successor of Peter. As such, you will have concern not only for this archdiocese and for the region that will be entrusted to, to you. You will have solicitude for the entire church working in the closest of communion with your brother bishops. You represent the vibrancy and diversity of this great local church of Toronto, tracing your origins to Malta, which has such important connections to the apostle whose feast we celebrate an appropriate day on which to receive Episcopal ordination. May you so carry out the office entrusted to you by the Holy Father as to continue on the path of perfection and enable others to come to know Christ better and experience the ongoing conversation that was the catalyst for the effective evangelization which St. Paul carried out as apostle to the Gentiles. As in his day, there are countless numbers of in our midst who are very much like the Gentiles to whom St. Paul preached the gospel of Christ, awaiting a word of faith, a word of hope, and an example of charity in these challenging and difficult times. And while limited in carrying out public acts of ministry, always keep in mind that your primary work is that of sanctification, which includes your continuous prayer, which, on account of the graces of your office, lend to them a singular efficacy. May Our Lady, St. Joseph, St. Michael, and St. Paul assist you in the carrying out of the office and ministry that has been entrusted to you in keeping with the graces you have received today and will continue receiving as a bishop within the Church of God. Indeed, may you serve the Lord with gladness. I once again renew the greetings of, the, of Pope Francis for you, dear Cardinal Collins, your bishops, and also the clergy, religious, and lay faithful of the Archdiocese of Toronto, so dear to him. Thank you, Monsignor. I now invite Bishop uh, Camilleri to say a few words. In today's Office of Readings on the Feast of the Conversion of St. Paul, 
We we'll read an excerpt of a homily from St. John Chrysostom, in which St. John says of St. Paul, the most important thing of all to him was that he knew himself to be loved by Christ. Enjoying this love, he considered himself happier than anyone else. It is with the same sentiment of joy in Christ that I express my gratitude to you, your eminence, for the celebration of this most sacred and humbling rite of ordination. I wish to thank you also for your guidance to me in the past 14 years in which I have shared in the ministerial priesthood, and more especially in the last 10 years in the ministry I have tried to fulfill in the best way I can as Chancellor of Spiritual Affairs. With the same joy in Christ, I wish to express my gratitude to Holy Father Pope Francis for calling me to this extension of the Ministry of Service. And I wish to thank his representative, Monsignor Roter, for being present here today. I wish to acknowledge, if I may be allowed to say, my brother auxiliary bishops, to thank them for their support and all the bishops who have written to me so kindly. In a particular way, I wish to thank Bishop Wasno and Bishop Nguyen as my principal co-consecrators. But from all of you, I am certain that I will learn much, and I hope that I can also be of assistance to you. I wish to express gratitude to my brother priests, with whom I have had the privilege of working in my ministry. I have always been edified by your steadfast perseverance and diligence in your work for the people of God, and you have been of great assistance to me. In a particular way, I wish to greet the priests and deacons of the Western Pastoral Region to which I have been appointed. I look forward to working with and for you. I wish also to greet the lay faithful of the Western Region. I look forward to being of service to you in prayer, in sacrament, and in pastoral care. I wish to greet the members of the Institutes of Consecrated Life and the Societies of Apostolic Life and other forms of religious life in the Archdiocese of Toronto as your appointed vicar. I hope on behalf of Cardinal Collins to get to know you and to be of assistance to you. I wish to thank my colleagues in the Chancery. You have enriched my ministry both as spiritual chancellor and as moderator of the Curia. I will miss being at the Pastoral Center because of you. Lastly, I wish to thank all of my family members who have been watching this celebration on live stream. In a particular way, of course, I wish to thank my mother for her constant support my brother Harold and his family who are watching from my mother's home, my brother Charles and his family who are watching from their home in Malta. I also want to take an opportunity to thank my cousins who share in the ministerial priesthood for their prayers. Monsignor Louis Camilleri in Malta, Father David Camilleri in England, and Bishop Walter Ibeyer in Brazil. And certainly, not least, I wish to thank all those involved in planning today's ordination, particularly those from the communications office, Father Mark and Father Ed, all the sacristans and everyone else. You have taken care of everything. All I have to do is make sure I turn up before 2 p.m. <laughs> to all, I ask you to please keep me in your prayers. I will certainly keep you in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Camilleri. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now and forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. Oh, 